Uh, so I think that that has somewhat lower barriers of entry. Uh, there's more competition there. And so that's one of the reasons I'm more concerned about Ethereum long-term than I'm about Bitcoin. And so if you compare Bitcoin to the other proof of work protocols, the ones that are trying to just do money, it's not even close. I mean, the, the biggest ones are like 2% of Bitcoin's market cap. One of the reasons why so many cryptocurrencies have failed is because they think that blockchains are good for everything. And so they try to apply blockchains for everything. But in reality, blockchains are really inefficient. I think the long-term story is about adoption. So the more people that own it and the more institutions that own it, that keeps driving up the structural floor for the price. There are plenty of people that would buy Bitcoin, you know, no matter what it does in terms of price. And so when you hear about things like, like exchanges being hacked, uh, you know, that's not Bitcoin itself being hacked. Those are custodians holding it. Bitcoin really has stood the test of time in terms of being a very simple code base um, and a very hard form of money. And so for people that don't mind volatility, I find the probability of it going to zero pretty low. Just to follow up on that, mentioning um, self-custody and uh, the ability of nations also to somehow uh, regulate these exchanges and companies. From your own perspective, and if you would also give somehow insight to retailers watching this, uh, how would you strategize segmenting your cryptos in what, what, what's a comfortable percentage for exchanges, hot wallets, and also cold wallets as well? Because at the end of the day, exchanges are super convenient and cold wallets and hot wallets are safer. However, I've, I've seen so many people lose their money as well, uh, putting it into self-custody. self, self, -custody, self -custody. So uh, where do you strike a balance, at least from your perspective as someone who's investing into this as well? As your amount that you own goes up, your security practices should also increase as well. Um, and your knowledge should increase so that you can do those security practices safely. Because as you rightfully pointed out, you know, it's, some people get in Bitcoin because they think that if I'm gonna buy a little bit of Bitcoin, I gotta, I gotta get like a hardware wallet and I gotta figure out how encryption works and I'm gonna mess this up and I gotta get like a steel plate to phrase in. And you know, it's like, no, if you, you can start by just buying some on exchange and that's that's an allocation. I mean, there's you know there is a risk of holding on the exchange, but if you're talking about a small allocation, of a couple percentage of your of your assets, that's fine to start with. That's a learning process, and then eventually, you know, you can you can get an inexpensive hardware wallet or a phone wallet. Actually, I would say start with a phone wallet, um, and then you know practice sending a small amount from your exchange to your phone wallet, and that kind of starts showing you the power of how this works. Um, and, uh, you know, basically gives you some comfort and experience with it. And when you do that a few times, um, and, and if you start to get a larger amount and you want to have a, a higher level of security, um, you can go and get a, a hardware wallet. Um, then you can send, you know, a, a decent chunk of your Bitcoin to your hardware wallet that is offline and it's the most resistant to any sort of, of, of you know, potential ways to lose your Bitcoin as long as you practice safe security. So what you generally want to do is have your hardware wallet. You want to have your seed phrase, which is a backup in case your hardware wallet breaks or something. Um, and you can you can write it down, but ideally you want to actually put that in, in a more robust way. So you, there's actually like this metal product where you can have your 24 word or 12 word phrase stored in, in like a metal, you know, engraving kind of. Um, and there and you can potentially have say two backup copies in safe locations. There are all sorts of things you can get into the more you learn about it. But really, I think the, the key thing is start small and then as your knowledge grows and as your amount grows, it becomes more meaningful, uh, you can start taking custody of that in different ways. And then even, even when you have quite a bit, it is still ideal to break it up a little bit. So you can have a big chunk in your in your hardware wallet. You can have some in a phone wallet. You can leave some with with you know a high quality exchange as long as it's not like a sketchy exchange. You can leave some there in case you want to sell some quickly or just to, you know to have it so that not all of what you own is self custody, um, and that really kind of diversifies your your risk of total loss. Um, and so that that's probably the way I would approach it. But when you were mentioning about the seed phrases, I, I heard of someone that he split his um, seed phrases and then they're in two separate vaults uh, where 
no no one has access to both both of them so that extreme measure of protecting their uh, their their seed phrases but i, I want to transition into smart contracts and i i just i i, I just want to get your insight on you mentioned the network effects of ethereum but there are a lot of uh smart contract blockchains coming out as well um is it you mentioned that ethereum is the is the biggest has the largest network effects does it mean that because of that um and ethereum is also transitioning to proof of stake what whatever is coming out regardless if it's polkadot or cardano um they will have a relatively hard time also um taking a crack at the dominance of ethereum as well uh so i think that, that has somewhat lower barriers of entry uh there's more competition there and so that's one of the reasons i'm more concerned about ethereum long term than I'm about bitcoin and so if you compare bitcoin to the other proof of work protocols the ones that are trying to just do money it's not even close i mean the, the biggest ones are like two percent of bitcoin's market cap uh if you look at smart contract platforms uh we see for example if you look at stable coins let's, let's take tether for example it's not you know it's the it's the original stable coin that used to run on top of bitcoin uh, on the omni layer and when ethereum came around um they they moved over to using ethereum um because it was, it was a better suited protocol for it um and when ethereum started to get expensive right because it has scaling issues and because it was doing well you know in terms of demand it, its block space was in demand it became very high fees um and so if you were sending small stablecoin transactions it wasn't good to do it on ethereum and so we actually started to see tether spill over to tron of all things uh you started to see literally literally like half of, of tether went to tron because they could get lower fees and we're starting to see that some of these stablecoin providers are also you know rolling out on solana and some of these other you know others are their smart contract chains and so some of those applications um you know there's there's low switching costs to move your 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 applications to a cheaper chain as long as you think there's some some reasonable baseline of security and of course there you know the trade off is some of the ones they move to are more centralized even than so ethereum's you know arguably more centralized than bitcoin and then when you look at things like tron or solana you know they're more centralized than ethereum and, and so you, you kind of just keep rotating around to whatever is working um Now Ethereum has you know the advantage so basically I think you described it well so Ethereum basically is a, a generation 2 protocol so it made a lot of advances when it came out um but then we had later ones come out that you know started with proof of stake from the beginning uh they started with a cleaner starting point and so you have you know Solana for example um and so Ethereum is kind of competing where it has the network effect that's the big thing it has was competing with these newer technologies and trying to update and keep up with those other technologies without losing its network advantage. Some of the things in Ethereum's favor are for example, you know, um like MetaMask and things like that. We have these larger pools of capital and these larger companies like Consensus that are designing these these applications that that make that Ethereum ecosystem kind of sticky. In addition, the NFT environment people buy nfts and those are stuck to a blockchain and so they have a lot of interest in staying with that blockchain and trying to keep that blockchain healthy because of ethereum you know eventually kind of withers away and and one of these other ones comes well the value of all those nfts goes down a lot and so for example if you look at crypto punks right so those are a, a popular nft they have the same crypto punks on solana and they trade at a much much lower price um and and so the the most expensive crypto punks on Solana are like cheaper than the least expensive ones on Ethereum because you know people have a higher assessment of Ethereum being around 10 years from now than Solana but if that becomes a reverse and Solana gains market share over Ethereum then those NFTs on Ethereum would probably you know weaken in terms of 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 price uh, and some of those Solana ones would become more expensive And so really, you know, there is kind of a self-reinforcing cycle there. Um but I would say that smart contract platforms overall have a higher risk of displacing each other over time because it kind of it comes down more to which one has better features, which one is cheaper to use. Um but it, but it's not a pure commodity play. There there are still some sticky things that kind of keep people attached to one of them. And this is also When, when we when we look at it like you mentioned about NFTs um if majority of the artists are in Ethereum it would 
would it be also hard for them to transfer because all they know everyone that's following them is there as well or Uniswap is also in it in Ethereum there's there's so much apps that have been built around it that people are actually using right now and as a user if you are if you like something you use it and it's working well would it be also hard for them to switch to something that's almost the same as it considering that people were willing to pay high gas fees for ethereum and it wasn't really it, it's an issue but people were still were still using it so I, I, is it is it is it a good is it a good way to look at it that um since the users are still in ethereum it may take something very very massive for people actually to shift as well and not just from a technology side but from a user side I think partially. So, I mean, there's kind of two parts. So for the first part of the question, we do see, for example, there are applications that run on two different blockchains, right? Mm -hmm. So there are some that run on Ethereum and Binance Smart Chain, for example. And we see, for example, like the NFTs, they make a set on Ethereum and they make a set on Solana. And so there's really not a problem there. But the second part about where the users are, that's much harder to change. Uh, and so that's really the, where the network effect is. And so in my view, you know, kind of comes down to if, if Ethereum is working fine and then another blockchain comes along and says, hey, we're a little bit cheaper, um, you should come to our chain, it's probably not going to work. People are like, I'm not like, I'm not going to switch my bank if another bank says, you know, instead of paying you 1% interest, we're going to pay you 1.1% interest. I'm not, <laughs> it's not worth the change. But if that bank says, hey, we're going to pay you 8% interest and we can do it safely, well, then you got, then you got my attention. It's basically way better. Um, and so when it comes to Ethereum versus other blockchains, the big risk I would see is that if Ethereum does not scale well um, and it keeps having persistently very high fees, um, especially the way it got like, kind of when it was booming, uh, that that's kind of the big catalyst that could start to shift users elsewhere. If it, if it becomes so expensive to use that it just starts putting pressure for people to kind of diversify the chain, the, the blockchains that they use. Um, so it really kind of comes down to how well the development team can scale, um, a, you know, before these competitors kind of get up to full speed. DeFi, looking at it from a, I guess, a normal person's point of view, it's it still hasn't come to a point where it's easy to use. It requires a lot of steps for people to actually use it. Um, do you think it will come to a point that it becomes practical already for everyone to use, or? This is just something for the for the here and now. One of the reasons why so many cryptocurrencies have failed is because they think that blockchains are good for everything. And so they try to apply blockchains for everything. But in reality, blockchains are really inefficient. Um, they're, you know, there's a re like there's a reason they're not used for that many things, and it's because they're really inefficient. Uh, basically, like if you're running an application on Ethereum, it's much, much cheaper to run it on Amazon Web Services. Right, so it's, it's it's a fraction of the cost to run it on a more centralized cloud computing platform. Um, the main benefit you get from blockchain is decentralization, um, and so that's why Bitcoin is extraordinarily valuable. The problem with some of these other areas is that they're only partially decentralized, and so, for example, Ethereum has problems if if uh, Infura goes down, right? So it has these centralized hubs. Um, and so, and, and ironically, a lot of the nodes are hosted on Amazon Web Services. And so if, if there is some sort of regulatory crackdown and Amazon and Microsoft, and these other cloud platforms that you can't run your nodes, that would make them much harder to use and more expensive probably. Um, and so the risk there is that if, if they don't achieve sufficient decentralization, then it's kind of like fake decentralization. It looks like decentralization, but it's not truly decentralized in the way that I would argue that Bitcoin is. Um, now, I do think that there's a lot of value here long term in the sense that, I mean, stable coins are an obvious improvement over many other types of payments, right? So anyone who's used stable coins, you can like you can send someone stable coins on a Sunday night, like internationally, and not have to really think about it. Whereas if you wanted to send your bank, if you wanted to do a wire transfer internationally, one is you can't do it on the weekend uh, you, in most countries. And two, there, there's periods where like you lose your funds. Like, like you don't know, like the bank says they sent it and you have no way to track it. And then it's like, why isn't it getting there? And it's just a really, it's an old system where stable coins are a much better system. Um, and so a lot of these technologies I think have a long-term future. You know, I, I think the idea of a decentralized exchange 
for a decentralized liquidity provider, right? Where you can you can put collateral in like Bitcoin or whatever else and get stable coins out. I think those are probably here to stay in one form or the other in the long run. Um, but you know, it remains to be seen how big of a market that can be, right? Because if you look at the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem, a lot of it is about speculation. It's like you're 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 putting tokens in, you're getting stable coins out, you're using the stable coins to buy, you know, to participate in, in buying other tokens, and those tokens are like shares of other de decentralized exchanges, and then you're so it's like this really kind of circular speculative thing. Even the NFT uh, environment is is rather speculative. So not a ton of people are buying that art just because they like that art. I mean, I can copy the art and just look at it if I like how one of the the, the penguins look, for example, they're very cute. I could I could just copy my favorite one and, and have it. part of why they buy it is because they're they're anticipating that the price is going to go up. Um, so even the NFT space, which is you know you think could be a non financial application, so it could be you know there there are different things you can do with that, which I think have long term interesting implications. Right now, it's still pretty speculative, and I think that this has to go through more bear cycles. To kind of find the actual long-term use case here. Um, I mean, there is an example on the Liquid blockchain, for, which is associated with Bitcoin. There was like a movie ticket released as an NFT, um, and someone can exchange that with someone else. And so, I mean, that's an interesting use case. We'll see if that kind of thing takes off. I mean, there are potential use cases of NFTs, uh, as an example, um, but you know, a lot of it now is associated with speculation. And I think this has to go through a, a number of kind of, you know, down cycles before we find out what's real. You mentioned something about liquidity providers, and I, I want to ask your thoughts on this. Um, a lot of them provide very, very high API, APYs, APRs. Um, how, how sustainable do you think this is? And as what you've mentioned, it's just moving from, they're just uh, money or tokens are just moving from one decentralized exchange to, un, to another. How can they give that high of a rate? So long term, I think that it's not sustainable and it's going to go down and it's already going down. Uh, and so, for example, if you looked at DeFi yields back in the springtime, they were much higher than they are now that that the broader crypto space has had a correction. Um, and if you look at, you know, in the United States, you have BlockFi. That's not a DeFi protocol, but it's a it's a it's a, a kind of like a bank you can, you can put in. Bitcoin, Ethereum, stable coins, and you can earn a yield on it. Um, and th they've had to keep cutting their rates uh, because there are ways to arbitrage that that money and earn that yield has diminished. And so part of those yields exist because it's a small, inefficient market, right? So the more players that come in, eventually gets more and more efficient and those those yields diminish. Um, and two, um, just, you know, as you get out of very speculative phases, um, you know, there's less demand for leverage and things like that. And so uh, those rates come down. And so I do think that they will eventually, and, and they already are, I think they're eventually going to get lower um, to a point. I mean, I still think there's going to be ways to generate yield for the long run, uh, most likely, uh, but not at, at you know, rates that are like, you know, five, six, 10 times higher than a, than a bank yield. I want to ask something about this. And this is something that is, uh, Kind of a hot item to where we are in in Asia. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard about NFT games and particularly Axie Infinity, those play-to-earn games, and it's becoming uh, a a big thing. Also, in-game earnings, in-game rewards, and since they're tokenized, you can swap it to real cash. Uh, do you think this will be a good entry point for a lot of people to have exposure to the cryptocurrency world? And um, given that the gaming industry is so big. Um, is, will this usher in, I guess, a new era also of people understanding cryptos more? And how do you see the sustainability of this as well? So I, I think that can be a long-term viable use case. Um, and so part of why cryptocurrencies have caught on with younger people faster than older people is that a lot of us grew up playing games and we have an appreciation that digital items can have value, right? So if you played a game you got like a rare sword that's really powerful um that's worth something right so and nfts can make a situation where like imagine if you could take your items that you earn in a game and bring them to another game 
that it, that accepts them, right? So you actually own those items outside of just that one gate. And so I think that's a I think that's an interesting long term uh, potential use case, right? So I, I would like to be able to play a game and be able to kind of keep my items and bring them to another game. Um, and so I think that's a you know that's one way for people to become familiar with these assets. Um, the risk there is that you know a lot of these games are kind of these lower quality types of tokens. And so one of the, one of the first ones was CryptoKitties back in 2017, right? So for people that aren't familiar with that, there's this game called CryptoKitties on Ethereum, and it's like you could breed these little cats, um, and they were all these unique cats, and they had their own unique traits. Um, and it actually was kind of a problem because Ethereum had scaling problems and still does. So it actually kind of clogged up the Ethereum blockchain. It drove up the fees high because people were trading people were trading and breeding these little cats. And if you look now, for example, no one really cares about crypto kitties. So we've had all these other people care about crypto punks. They care about pudgy penguins, but they don't care about crypto kitties anymore. Um, and so the risk is that something could be a fad and it seems like it has value but five years later, it does not have that. Uh, and, and I would say that more, you know, most things in the space that seem like they have value now probably won't have a ton of value in five years, but there will probably be some that do. So you know, I think Bitcoin has the highest odds of being worth a ton of money in five years. Um, and then there's gonna probably be other things in the space. There could be certain pieces of art where there could be certain other blockchains that do very well, um, but the odds are generally not on your side if you're talking about, you know, these various digital assets, you know, appreciating price in the long term. Final two questions before we put this to a close. Um, n- number one was, when we saw the markets drop last May 19, 2021, um, what was going on in your head? And what what were you doing at that time, seeing uh, market uh, markets crash as well? Were you on the offensive or were you thinking, oh no, this might... Uh, this might fall even more, and I ju- I just better off uh, store my cash first and wait for something to happen. I was kind of expecting it because, like I said before, when we started to see like Dogecoin go vertical and Ethereum Classic go vertical, and just all these, and, and literally we had an inverse correlation between quality and and percent gain. It was not surprising to see a correction there. Hmm. When Bitcoin broke below a certain key level that I was watching. I basically, you know, gave an extra note to my my research base, my clients, and I said, okay, we we, we broke in the bullish structure, um, and so that can mean different things to different people. Some people might want to trade out of that. Other people, it's like, okay, just make sure you're not leveraged or things like that. I mean, I I do without leverage, so for me, it was actually not a big deal. It was actually kind of a relief to see some of the excess come out of the market, um, and we also a lot of part of that was driven by the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. And so that that you know during the second half of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, that created a neutral arbitrage opportunity that was kind of sucking in a lot of excess Bitcoin into the GBTC structure, and that eventually unwound, uh, and, and, and you know that that kind of eventually lost a major source of demand. So that kind of cleared out a lot of stuff. That was also when we started to see all that news out of China about miners migrating. So some of those miners were probably forced sellers. And so what I focused on was, you know, seeing how the price action works out, right? Because no one wants to buy into a a sharply falling asset. And I kept saying, okay, so we have a correction here. Uh, This is healthy. Um, And you can either, you know, keep dollar cost averaging in if that's what you're doing, or you can wait to see if it breaks above certain levels. And so, for example, I was watching about 41,000 or 42,000 for Bitcoin because it was kind of in that, that range for a while. And I said, once we start to see it break out of that, that would be pretty healthy. Um, and so there's different approaches to trade it, but because I had an allocation that was comfortable for me, right? So I've, I've studied it quite a bit. I bought it at a at a low price. And so it's, it's become a pretty big percentage of my portfolio, but it's still manageable enough that when I see it fall in price like that, I'm expecting these types of pullbacks. It's a very volatile asset, I'm unlevered. And so it didn't really bother me too much. And I kept focusing on, for example, what's happening with development? What's happening with the Lightning Network? What's happening with El Salvador? What's happening with all these other aspects of the actual fundamentals rather than just the price action? Because just like any value stock, for example, you know, people say Bitcoin has no fundamentals, but it's funny because there are actually hundreds of, of companies working on, on different Bitcoin applications 
working on second layer solutions like Liquid and Lightning, uh, working on new hardware wallets. The ecosystem around it keeps building and strengthening. And especially the Lightning Network, I, I think is one of the most interesting areas because it's kind of hitting critical mass this year in terms of usability and, and uh, liquidity. Um, and so just like how a value stock, you can have the price, you know, sometimes it becomes overvalued compared to its fundamentals, sometimes it becomes undervalued compared to its fundamentals. You can have the same sort of effect with, with cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular, where generally the asset keeps getting better over the long run, more things you can do with it, uh, more ease of use with it, more institutions involved with it, um, but that price can fluctuate quite a bit. And so I just kept focusing on the fundamentals and letting the price sort itself out. Will we ever come to a point where it will be treated like a stock that you somehow get to value it? Or will it just everything be based on some arbitrary uh, analysis based on market cap, stock to flow model, model halving, etc.? Et 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 Do you think there will be a, a, a way for us to actually know, okay, this should be the value of Bitcoin at this point in time based on what, what we have left right now? And I, I guess, I, I guess I'm also curious about this that miners have pulled the system. Um, what happens when the last Bitcoin is mined? Um, will that be an issue? Will miners stop mining as well when there's no more incentive for them to uh, protect the system? Yeah, so the first question, I would separate between Bitcoin and other assets. So the bigger that Bitcoin gets, the more it just becomes like money, right? So right now it's a volatile asset that's, that's kind of becoming money in some cases, in some aspects. Um, but it's still small and volatile. And so if Bitcoin goes up five or 10 X and it's held by far more people, that becomes more and more like money. And so you start, instead of valuing Bitcoin, you value other things relative to Bitcoin. And one of the charts I like to use, um, Jurian Timmer, he's the global uh, head of macro at Fidelity. Uh, so one of the world's largest asset managers. Um, and he has a model that shows, for example, um, Bitcoin's long-term price potential, assuming it's it's adopted by people about as quickly as um, smartphones, right? So it makes an assumption about it continuing to catch on, but then it has a price model kind of showing what, what kind of price it would have to reach in order for it to be able to support that many users, basically more and more money piling in. And so if you kind of, you know, assume that it continues to have the adoption speed that it has, you can have kind of a reasonable price range for where it should be, but of course it will fluctuate up and down around that price action. You can't say, for example, on September 9th, 2023, this is how much it'll be, but you can say, okay, five years from now, if, 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 you know, if this continues to be used by people about as quickly as, as smartphones did, then you can expect the price to be roughly this order of magnitude. Um, and so I, I find those models interesting to have in the back of my mind, even though I can't guarantee that they're going to work out that way, because again, we don't know how, how the demand will change over time, different regulatory risks. Um, my base case is that more people will use it, the price will go up long-term, and so it's helpful to have some models. Um, if you look at other crypto assets, sometimes they can be valued like a company. For example, if you look at some of those decentralized exchanges, you can actually look at how much trading volume is happening compared to some some you know traditional exchanges and see what the traditional exchanges are valued at and then kind of do a comparison and see maybe what the decentralized exchanges could be worth especially because some of those tokens are eventually able to pay out earnings almost like dividends uh, from the fees they collect for using that exchange and so they can potentially be treated like equities except that they you know their regulatory environment's a lot less certain uh, because as we're seeing in the united states the securities and exchange commission uh probably considers a lot of them to be unregistered securities um because you know that's essentially what they are they're equity like assets that didn't really get you know vetting of an equity um and so i think that if if that becomes the norm and they get more regulatory clarity some of this could be valued you know long term like equities uh, now, to, to your last question, uh, so Bitcoin uh, miners receive two things. They receive the block subsidy, which is the new coins, but they also receive transaction fees. Um, and so when the blockchain's full, and it often is, um, you have to pay a fee in order to make sure your your uh, your transactions processed uh, in a timely manner. Um, and of course, those 
those fees fluctuate based on it during a bull market they tend to go up quite a bit because more people are, are using it the blockchain's more full um and if in a bear market those fees tend to be lower um but because the bitcoin block size is not increasing um but the user base is increasing those those blocks are increasingly becoming uh full most of the time and so that generates uh fees um and so there's no end uh, to how long fees will be part of the, the space. And those can last a thousand years, for all we know. Um, the big question is, will Bitcoin become big enough and will those fees become large enough uh, for Bitcoin to be fully secure? And I think that remains an open question. I think it's one of the, 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 the final long-term risks of Bitcoin. I think we'll know in about maybe 15 years. So even though there are still be new Bitcoins generated then, I mean, the last Bitcoin won't be generated until around 2140. Um, but really, you know, by about 15 years from now, the vast majority of Bitcoins will be generated. And so fees, like transaction fees will become a very big part of minor revenue. And so by then we'll see how big Bitcoin is um, and we'll see how that fee structure looks. So I think that's an important risk to monitor, um, but it's not as though once the final Bitcoin is mined, that miners are done. It really kind of comes down to whether or not fees are large enough. And, and even then, I mean, there's a difficulty adjustment. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if miners are unprofitable and they stop mining, the difficulty adjustment will automatically come down until it becomes profitable for new miners to come in. And the only question becomes whether or not the total amount of miners is, is providing sufficient security for Bitcoin so that it's too costly for any kind of malicious entity to go and buy like half the miners and then start doing 51% attacks on Bitcoin. So I, ideally you want the miner base to be large enough and expensive enough that, that no entity can, can you know, realistically attack the chain. Um, and so as long as that threshold's not reached, um, it should be secure. But it, it, it basically we'll see in the next 10, 15 years how that develops. And so it's a long-term question to monitor. To put this to a close, um, there's a lot of people from the Philippines and Southeast Asia watching this. And you have a very, very inspiring story of how you also invested and built your wealth over time. Um, any words of encouragement for them, particularly the ones that are financially hit uh, in this time of the pandemic, in this crisis, and uh, as, as the Delta variant continues to increase, a lot of countries are in lockdown again, hence hitting some people's um, level of earning as well. Um, anything that you would want to live to leave with them? Find ways to increase your income doing things you enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me personally, I, I came from a, a pretty poor household um, and I went into engineering uh, and that, you know, I provided a good income from that. Um, but on the side, I was always interested in investing. And so I would build, and I was interested in building websites. So I'd build websites um, and I would also, then I had my own little investing blog. I eventually sold that before finally starting the company that I have now, right? So I started taking it seriously and developed a professional website and just focused on what I like doing. And that, you know, grew my income by quite a bit. And so, for example, if you, you know, save your money and you have a certain income and, you know, if you can increase your income by 20% doing something on the side, you can actually increase your savings rate by more than 20% because if you hold your, your fixed asset, like let's say you make $30,000 a year and your expenses are $20,000 a year, um, then you're saving $10,000 a year. But if you can make an extra $10,000, um, you know, it's only increased your income by 33%, but you've doubled your savings rate from $10,000 to $20,000. And so that's, and of course, those numbers can vary depending on where you are in the world, what kind of work you do. But the point is, if you can find ways to boost your income by a moderate amount uh, while being disciplined with your savings rate, you can actually increase your savings rate by 50%, 100% or more. Um, and that's, you know, for me, that's really what kind of got the ball rolling in terms of building wealth and becoming financially free. Um, and, and I think the key thing is that as long as you're doing something you like, you end up you know, putting a lot of time into it and becoming good at it um, rather than trying to force something that you don't like. Um, and so that's kind of the, in my view, at least the, one of the keys to success. Well said, very, very well said. For those also who want to get your research, how can they get in touch with you? How can they get your services as well? Uh, so I'm at lynnalden.com and I have a lot of free material, free newsletter, 
Um, I'm a low cost research service. I'm also active on Twitter at Lynn Alden Contact. Uh, so I have a bunch of obviously free uh, posts there. So people are, you know, can find me in a couple of different ways. Got it. Thank you so much, Lynn Alden. It was an honor to have you in this show. And I do hope that to everyone who's watching this, this was something that uh, gave you value and also gave you insight and helped you analyze the cryptocurrency markets even more. So thanks, Lynn. Uh, and to everyone, uh, I hope this video helps you trade well, trade strong, trade smart. See you all again soon and God bless you all.